The views and opinions expressed in the following program are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of KSMQ Public Service Media Incorporated or its assigns. Do you hear the call of the wild? Do you want the outdoors experience in your backyard? We're talking tips you may not want to know. Stay with us. You're watching Garden Connections. Welcome to Garden Connections. I'm Amy Whitaker. Thank you for joining us. I'm happy to introduce Steve and Bill. They are here to help us. Call in now and ask your questions. The number will be at the bottom of your screen. So Steve and Bill, we are talking wildlife. How do we bring wildlife to our landscape or garden and how do we keep it there? What types of wildlife can we expect to see in our area? The wildlife most people are trying to introduce into the yards are the, the bur butterflies, birds, and maybe even the bees. There are certainly wildlife that people don't want to introduce into the yards, um, but it's usually the butterflies and the bees that'll come, and it's a whole bunch of flowers that'll bring them in. You bring in, the, uh, you bring in a diversity of the, uh, the flowers, and you're going to bring in a diversity of the uh, butterflies and the insects, and then the insects bring in the birds. And so when we're talking about ways to attract this wildlife. What do we need to keep in mind as far as providing for that wildlife? A diversity of species. Um, it's, it's just fine to plant one or two things in your yard, one or two really pretty flowers that you like a lot, but it's usually best to do a number of different flowers at one time so that you have a number of things uh, blooming at any given time. And also, you want to have plants that are appropriate for your soil and site conditions. So often people are attracted to a flower at the garden center, and then they find out it's a lot of work to keep that flower going by mending the soil and watering and such. With native plants, you're always looking at trying to, to get the right plant for the right situation, so eventually it's going to be happy where it is, and it's just going to do its thing all on its own. So you get a diversity of different species blooming all different during the different times of the year, and native plants do make a difference. There is a connection between the native plants and the native uh, bugs and butterflies, and thus the native birds. So you want to provide what they're used to or what they've kind of evolved with to keep them coming back. Are there any other things we should consider other than the plants themselves to keep these wildlife coming. Bill? Well, water features, of course, that, that definitely helps. Uh, <clears throat> there's been a big interest lately with uh, people actually setting up their, their gardens for uh, dragonflies. You know, there's quite a few different species of those that are around. And so, you know, having a, a variety of water features, you know, nearby, along with, of course, the diversity of plants will help bring those through. Uh, I talked with one person who was talking about actually setting up a dragonfly museum where they would bring through, you know, there's, there's quite a few species of those around, so there's, there's a whole thing. It's beyond anymore just, just the birds and butterflies. Uh, people are looking for a whole variety of things. Of course, in our area over by Winona, you never know, we get bears coming through, but no, the natives won't bring the bears through, but uh, <laughs> a lot Garbage of other things out will. there. Garbage yep. cans will. All right, so when we're talking about choosing plants, um, they're kind of in different categories. We've got the flowers or forbs, as some mm. people would call them. We've got shrubs. We've got trees. Where do we start when planning our landscape? Go ahead. Uh, where I would start would be to realistically assess what your soils are about. And you can usually pinpoint your soils quite easily. On a scale from wet to dry, you know, where is it? Is it somewhere in the middle? You know, most, most ideal garden soils are right in the middle. And, but if you have a sandy soil, you're probably towards a dry type of situation. Or if it's a really heavy soil 
and water collects in, a, in one place, it's going to be a wetter soil. One of the popular things to do right now is a rain garden. And that's where people in their yard will um, excavate a, a shallow area to allow the water to collect there for just a short time so it perks through the, uh, the, um, the soil. Well, that's a great opportunity to bring in some, some wetter plants. So doing to the, really assessing your area as to the soil conditions and also the sun conditions. How much shade are you getting? And, and how much sun, full sun are you getting? And from there, um, you know, the, the possibilities are endless. And you really can um, you know, find a number of different things that are appropriate for your situation. Um, the tool that I use uh, is our catalog from Prairie Moon Nursery. We uh, have uh, site, uh, soil and site conditions for all the different plants that we carry. We carry over 500 species. And so you can kind of weed through and find what would be appropriate for your area. From there, you know, with most naturalized plantings, you'd want to do about one plant per square foot to start out with. Now, and that's if you're doing a traditional gardening type of methodology. And after that, you know, really you can use all those regular gardening um, methods that you've learned about the, uh, you know, how, you know, the symmetry and, and, you know, putting the larger things in the back and the smaller things in the front. You know, gardening with native plants does not have to be, um, look like, you know, the, the back 40. It can, but if you, near your house, oftentimes you want things to look kind of, you know, well kept and you can use those same gardening principles that you use but using the native plants because the native plants really are what's going to bring in the native birds and the native um, uh, bugs including the butterflies and dragonflies. Right. And so when we're starting, oh go ahead. No, I was going to say, you know, that, and that's been kind of a question that we hear a lot. Okay, native plants, what is this whole thing with native plants? And I think Steve's just really hitting on that point that you have to have the native species, at least as a, a basic matrix there to draw these things in. You can have your, your tulips and, and, and other non-native species, and they're nice. I got some of those around my yard, too. But you need that real basic matrix of native species that'll, you know, act as host plants for a lot of different things. And then, of course, that brings your birds and other species in there. It works well. It's kind of like with the... Uh, the DOT, well, actually the DNR with their Roadside for Wildlife program, you know, which is becoming more and more popular across the state, where they're actually going along and using our roadsides, which are really kind of a, a great resource to have, and now they're, they're really picking up on that and designing seed mixes to put on there to support, of course, pheasants and so forth for game birds, but also all the songbirds and other, you know, nesting birds. That's why a lot of the roadsides, you don't see those mowed until real late in the summer so that the nesting continu can continue to happen, but also supports a variety of other wildlife along those public right-of-ways. Well, that's a very, very neat idea, and I think it'd be very, very beneficial for anybody who's driving along those roads to, you know, be able to see and hear and smell, you know, all the sensory things that that can offer. So when we're talking about choosing these plants, what kinds of food plants might you want to consider? Well, flowers. Um, you know, specifically, um, you know, we could uh, look at some of the uh, the flowers we have in the vase, vases yeah, right here. Well, I... This is this is what's blooming right now. Um, these are a few of the uh, the species that I uh, found on a drier prairie just uh, this afternoon. We've got the pale spike lobelia over in the Winona area. We've got a lot more to topography than you have here, and uh, we've got these areas called goat prairies. There are these south-facing hillsides that are really dry and hot. And most people, when they have a really dry, hot situation, they're thinking like, oh, there's nothing that's going to grow there. Well, all these plants will grow on a dry, hot uh, goat prairie. We've got this pale spike lobelia. We've got the um, harebell, Campanula rotundifolia. These white spikes here, these are the uh, white wild indigo, uh, Baptisia leucantha, or, or alba. Um, and then we've got the prairie sage, um, the artemisia. Um, so these are things that really will do well um, in a dry situation. Oh, and this, this white kind of baby's breath, it's a uh, Galeum boreali, the northern bed straw. And, you know, I find myself doing that a lot where I'll compare the native plants to things that you might normally see in a, a, a cultivated garden. 
for pretty much any uh, cultivated nursery plant that is out there, there's a native plant that can fill that same visual niche. Um, so these are all ones that definitely are going to bring in the, uh, the uh, insects, which are going to bring in the, uh, the birds. And you think of just like a suburban garden, you say, well, okay, that's a gopher, blah, blah. but if you're trying to do a rock garden, okay, there you go. Yeah. There's some plants that would work out perfect in those hot, dry conditions. And then maybe we could go, you know, some people talk, you know, some of the natives, well, you know, all these prairies, how showy are there? Okay, here's some right here. They're in flower right now, which probably meet most people's idea what would be fairly showy flowers. You'd almost go so far as to say they're kind of gaudy. <laughs> <laughs> At least this is. I just put this together hastily. Uh. But uh, oh, go ahead. Well, Steve, the, you know, the orange weed. one there is the butterfly weed, mm -hmm. and that's again a, uh, a species that does like a drier soil. But this particular one I found uh, in our um, our uh, prairie garden by the office, which has a fairly heavy uh, moist soil. The um, we have the uh, native one of the native phlox, the uh, phlox maculata, uh, goes by the name uh, sweet uh, wild sweet William. wild sweet William. Mm -hmm. um, that's a really nice one. Wild quinine here. Wild quinine is great because it has these kind of like popcorn-like uh, flowers, and they keep that look pretty much through the whole summer. So when you look out over a, uh, a prairie uh, garden or a prairie planting with that, it'll always have that nice kind of white speckled look about it. Um, the uh, grasses coming out of the top here, those are the uh, um, uh, Canadian wild rye. Um, it's just one of the many grasses of the, uh, the native prairies. Uh, one of the showier ones right now. Most of the uh, the prairie grasses you think of as the warm season grasses, so they put up their seed heads uh, later in the season. Back here, I don't know if you can see the um, uh, that's our pale purple cone flower. Um, there are many of the different uh, cone flowers that uh, do well uh, here. This is one that is you know pretty much strictly native. Um, coming out Just of the south top here, huh? we've got. I always think of the, uh, the summer as the uh, yellow composites uh, season. And most of the gardeners will know what composites are. They're the daisy-shaped flowers. And the prairies definitely have their share of the yellow composites. Here we've got the uh, uh, early sunflower, black-eyed Susans. We've got some Coreopsis on the other side there. Right. Mm -hmm. um, they're the, the yellow composites go all the way through the seasons. and. I had to fight some bubble bees to uh, cut some of these <laughs> flowers earlier today. So they really do bring in the, the, uh, the wildlife that way. And this kind of fuzzy one, again, kind of play, shows the uh, role of like the baby's breath. That's the uh, purple meadow rue. It's a really nice uh, plant that goes from you know, pretty much a, a middling soil to even a wetter soils. Can any of these provide food sources into the fall or even winter? Sure, the seeds. The seeds, mm -hmm. okay. and that's that. That's kind of a neat thing too. Is that um, you know, for pheasant habitat, and a lot of people are looking for that. Oftentimes, they they think of just switchgrass. They think, oh, I've heard the best thing for pheasant habitat is switchgrass. I don't need any of those flowers. But the flowers really do. They so right now while they're blooming, they bring in the insects, which um, really are the main protein source for the young uh, chick uh, chicks of pheasants. But then once they go to seed, sure enough, the seeds are a really great seed source for the uh, wildlife. I actually have a caller mm -hmm. question wondering oh. how do we deter rabbits and deer from taking all of our nice flowers and eating them? Well, one thing is um, plant a whole bunch of what you want. So if you put really close next to your house five individual flowers and a deer comes through your yard they're probably going to nip off each one of those five flowers so be generous have really large plantings with a lot of individual species and it doesn't have to be expensive you can do a lot of these from seed you know the uh, the the purple cone flowers you can do from seed you have you know many individuals in a, a generous border yeah the deer and the rabbits will come and get them but um, they're only going to get a certain percentage of them you're not going to miss them all that much but yeah if you only put a couple of them out there there's a good chance they're going to get them. So it's not so much as deter them, but 
uh, placate them maybe. Yeah. The other thing is we, we hesitate to uh, recommend a, a deer proof mix or rabbit because what we found is different areas of the region deer have different appetites. I've seen things on deer proof mixes that's a favorite food. I've seen smooth blue aster which in our area deer just they just love it. They go mow it right off. Not to say there won't be any left, but they really go for that versus maybe another area. They don't bother that. That's, they're kind of strange like that. So it's really hard. I mean, there are a few bulletproof ones, maybe alliums, you know, mm -hmm. the onion type species. They don't Prickly bother those. <laughs> yeah, that's yeah. native. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, there you go. Is there anything to the fact that deer and these native plants have cohabitated for many, many, many years oh. as opposed to some of the cultivated oh. varieties we may throw in our landscape. For sure. And another thing that's happening is our landscape is becoming so generic that you can imagine a deer that, you know, is seeing cornfields and mowed lawns, all of a sudden seeing some flowers is like, you know, any child will love to be, you know, in the candy store, but if they're in the candy store long enough, pretty soon they're going to want something a little more nutritious. And I think that really happens with the deer. You know, like mm -hmm. with what Bill was saying, with they have different tastes, whatever they're used to, they're going to want something slightly different. Yeah, so, so yeah, the deer, the deer have evolved with uh, our native landscapes here, um, but they will see some of the cultivated plants as candy, as anyone who's ever tried to grow hostas will attest to. The deer really like hostas. It's an exotic tasting thing to them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, they, they, they will, um, they'll like the unique thing, just like people. You never know. We had turkeys that come through the front yard and eat these. So, <clears throat> usually when they're in seed, but. Yeah, yeah, it's true. One, you know, one thing that just made me think about the cone flowers. Not a lot of people realize this, but the cone flowers are really good for the hummingbirds. And I would not have believed it if I hadn't seen it myself. You know, you always <coughs> think of hummingbird plants are those with red flowers with kind of a tube mm -hmm. type a shape about them. But given the right time of year, you'll come by and you'll see the hummingbirds just, you know, nicking at the uh, the purple cone flowers getting a little bit of nectar from each one of those um, flowers in the comp composite. Mm -hmm. And we do have another caller question. Okay. Um, this caller is wondering from the time you seed a prairie with these types of flowers, how long to maturity when they will be blooming like this, you know, from year to mm -hmm. year? And how long does the bloom season last? Um, I'm going to take that. You know, we, it, it depends, but in general, if somebody's got good site preparation, prepared the soil well, eliminated all the growing plants, of course, but then tried to get the seed bank down to a reasonable level. And say if they plant in the dormant season, which would be the fall, which has <coughs> excuse me, more of the ideal time to plant those, uh, a lot of times the first growing season, I tell folks, I eh, don't expect anything. Now, sometimes there'll be a few things that bloom, but of course, we want to keep the weeds down, just keep that mowed off the first year. The second year, sometimes you'll see a large flush of black-eyed Susan, some of the earlier successional species. And then after that, usually going into the third or fourth year, and it depends on what you put down. We One of the more popular mixes we have is what we call our grand diversity mix. We've got over 100 species in there. Now, the, by the third year, you're going to see a lot of things growing. You're going to see a lot of things blooming. And we design those so that you will start getting things blooming right away, sometimes in May, uh, late April, on up until the end of the season, right up through frost. So we, we always try and cover that. But there may be species in there that may be seven, eight years before they reach maturity amongst, you know, they're slower to develop species. We don't have, like, compass plant here. Compass plant usually probably four or five years before they actually put on a, a seed head. But those plants are known to live 100 years. So once wow. they're there, they're there. And that's in a naturalized situation. Mm -hmm. You know, if you're doing a larger area using a seed mix, that's what we would call a naturalizing situation. But if you take, you know, a packet of these seeds and you do it in a garden situation and you're pulling the weeds, you know, on either side of the row of the plants, some of these you can get a flower much, much faster. You know, the black-eyed Susans and even the purple cone flowers, there's a good chance you'll get a, a bloom the first year. Now, to your question about how long will they bloom, that goes to, you know, what, what kind of seeds did you put down? And what we always suggest at Prairie Moon is a diverse seed mix. 
you want to have things that are bloom, you know, the early uh, bloomers mm -hmm. and the late bloomers, and then everything in between. And not just one early thing and not just one late thing, but three, four, five of them. So that, you know, in a, a naturalized seeding, maybe one or two of those plants don't take on right away. Well, in those first years, maybe you'll have, you know, a few things that come up early and a few things late and a few things in the middle. But then with every year, you're going to get more and more diversity, and it's going to start to function and look, you know, much more like a, uh, a native ecosystem. And we had another caller question. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, if somebody is like highly allergic to bees, is it a good idea for them to put in something like this? Will the bees kind of stay away and mind their own business, or are they going to have to worry about the bees coming up more into their like yard area and giving them the problems? Well, it depends. Um, what I found out, I you know, before I really got into this, I was a little, a little touchy about bees. I went out one day and I had a whole field. It was a production field of Monarda fistulosa bergamot. And it's you know waist high, just solid flowers. And I'm trying to go through there, and it's just this loud zzz. There are bees. There's bumblebees, honeybees, solitary bees. You name it, just solid across there. They're so busy feeding on those flowers. If you're highly allergic to them, uh, they're, they're not going to sting you in that case. But you know, like if you got them around your house and you sit down on one or something, you could get stung. But my experience is when the bees are around the flowers, they're so much more interested in the flowers than you. Usually, bees don't sing unless you're. Uh, you, actually, you can go out like that off the flowers. They don't come after you. If you do like that, you're in front of their hive. It's a different type of right, thing. Right. But as long as they're not nesting right there, I think you're in good shape and it wouldn't be a problem. Yeah, it's really how you approach, uh, you know, approach them. And you know, I think anyone who is sensitive to bees has learned that. Um, mm -hmm. But they're out there, and they, they need to be out there for a lot of good reasons. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, we all need to be uh, careful. I mean. Um, I, I know I nearly passed out once from a bee sting. And it made me nervous, but it really was my accident. I thought it was a, uh, a fly, and I was you know, uh, whisking it away from me. And sure enough, it was a bee, and I squished it right onto me. So um, being careful is probably the best thing you're going to do. We live in a world with a lot of, a lot of other um, creatures out there. And so um, you know, being aware of that, sure. And we've talked a lot about the wildflowers. How about some trees that can provide shelter or sh other shrubbery type things mm -hmm. that can provide food for some of those larger aspects of the landscape? I'll give you one quick shrub, which, <clears throat> and this isn't one that people think about very much. It's a, a shrub that's common here in southeast Minnesota. It's called New Jersey tea. It's a little shrub, and it gets about yay high and bushes out. Quite attractive, little white flowers on it. That, um, that particular shrub is pollinated by a little solitary bee. And it so happens when the hummingbirds are raising their young, you always think hummingbirds, nectar, nectar, and of course that's where they're usually at. But their young require a protein diet at a certain point, and that bee is there at just the right time. Uh, that, that flower's flowering, the bee's there, the hummingbird comes, feeds on that bee, and thus goes back and feeds its young. And it, it requires it. It has to have that protein diet to take back. So there's an example of a shrub and you know a relationship we usually don't think about. But you go into the trees, and there's many, many native trees that you know support all the wildlife. Some might be what the uh, um, hackberries. Hackberry is one that um, um, has a lot of connections between um, certain butterflies. Um, prickly ash is one, mm -hmm. which you, you'd yeah. probably want to use in a fairly <coughs> limited way in a landscape, but it's an attractive butterfly. I think it's the uh, one of the swallowtails mm -hmm. is um, a dependent on the prickly ash. Mm -hmm. Black um, cherry, I think, might be one of the highest right, with right. the number of butterflies that you know, sure. depend on that one. So A lot of the shrubs you think of um, for their, their berries, um, and that would be the dogwoods. There are several mm -hmm. different uh, dogwoods. Right now, one of my favorite, you see it out in the wild. You see it in um, a commercial or you know, uh, planted landscapes now, the pagoda, pagoda dogwood, uh, Cornus alternifolia. Mm -hmm really attractive plant and it really does have some nice berries that um, the uh, the birds come through at certain times of year and they take mm -hmm. all those away um, it's it's 
to me, it should be a landscape standard. It's so attractive. Another one that I really like right now that is you know, such a common species, and I, I just can't believe I, I don't see it in uh, people's landscapes more, is the um, prairie nine bark. Uh, Physocarpus mm-hmm. opiofolius. Oh, I got that right at my front door. Yeah, it's so beautiful. Well, people has, think of it being so big, but yeah. you know, I just trim it back every year, and it's a nice little shrub. Like with all there. shrubs, you have to do some sort of a renewal pruning to keep it to the size that you want. But it has these nice cascades of flowers early in the spring. And then it starts to form these capsules. Right now, they're kind of a salmon pink color. Mm-hmm. And then those, those, uh, uh, those pink capsules, capsules become kind of brown capsules that open up and almost have a flower-like look about them, too. And really put the, attractive. And a lot of sh- seed that, you know, it just looks yeah. like bird seed, yeah. <laughs> yeah. actually. Yeah. It and does and feed a lot of things. And so many of those seeds, you know, you, you don't really, you know, see the birds eating them, but... At certain times of the year, there's a lot of little birds under these shrubs. What are they doing there? Well, they're mm-hmm. finding the seed. Or they're, or they're certain capsules, they'll just put their beak right in there, and they pretty much snort the seed right in if they catch it at the right time. And then maybe just a quick yell out on the uh, American cranberry. Yeah, uh, everyone yeah. loves that. Of course, that. everybody's Viburnum, starting to yeah. pick that up it's, right mm-hmm. now. And that's really attractive, too. You know, the red berries on that, really nice. Mm-hmm. Uh, here's another one are the, uh, the Sambucus, the... Um, uh, elderberries. elderberries, right? And there's, you know, there's the common one uh, with the kind of the purple berries that are mm-hmm. so attractive. And if you've ever tried to get elderberry, like make elderberry the birds, lines, yeah, good luck. really, really <laughs> difficult. Um, and then there's the other, uh, the uh, the Sambucus pubescens, which I call the other uh, elderberry. And it has just clusters of red berries that are really attractive. Um, pretty soon here. And unfortunately, we have run out of time already. No. Uh, oh, yes, it went I very mean, just fast. one thing, you know, if Go people ahead. have further questions, I know we just hit a few things. We're prairiemoon.com. They can find us right there. We've got a toll-free number. Steve loves to talk. Both of us love to talk <laughs> on the phone, the phone, so. All right. Well, thank you again time. for joining us and all of your great information, and thank you for joining us. And remember, for more information, log on to ksmq.org and click on Garden Connections. There you can find past episodes, read the blogs, where you, and where you can submit your ideas. Now your space is on its way. Tune in next week when we'll share more tips and talk shop about what's on your mind and in your garden. For everyone at Garden Connections, I'm Amy Whitaker. See you next week.